You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 264. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well-being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Hey veggie lover, welcome to another episode in the fasting series. Now this series is intended to provide education about the potential health and longevity benefits of different forms of fasting, including time-restricted eating, intermittent fasting, and extended water-only fasting. Please be aware that in this series, we will be discussing different forms of fasting and food restriction. And in some cases, there will be references to body size and weight. This material and these methods are not appropriate for children, pregnant people, or people with certain medical conditions. Please do not attempt these practices without medical supervision as it could be very dangerous. These concepts may also be triggering for people with disordered eating or eating disorders, so please practice discretion before listening to these episodes. Thank you and I hope that you enjoy this episode. Mindy Pals, MD, is a renowned holistic health expert and one of the leading voices in educating women about their bodies. She is on a mission to start a women's health revolution. Teaching her signature five-step approach, Dr. Mindy has empowered hundreds of thousands of people around the world to harness their body's own healing abilities through fasting, diet variation, detoxing chemicals from the body, stress management, and lifestyle changes as keys to achieving optimum health and slowing down the aging process. Dr. Mindy's high-profile clients include entertainer Leanne Rimes, former race car driver Danica Patrick, and actress Kat Graham, co-host of their joint podcast, Women United. She has also worked with popular influencer Jesse Itzler, Olympic athletes, Academy Award-winning actors, Silicon Valley CEOs, and countless patients looking to supercharge their body's healing powers. There is nothing that Dr. Mindy loves more than empowering people to take back control of their health, and she has been featured on Extra TV, The Doctors, Daily Mail TV, on Well Plus Good, Real Simple, Healthline, SheFinds.com, and in Parade, Muscle and Fitness, and Intermittent Fasting magazine magazines, amongst many others. A native of Los Angeles, Dr. Mindy pursued her early passion for wellness at the University of Kansas, where she was a member of the tennis team, and earned her Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology. She currently lives in San Jose, California with her family. Key takeaway from this episode. It is safe and beneficial to fast. When you fast, you go into a healing state that you cannot access with just food or with supplements. Fasting is not optional. It is a necessary tool for health. Women can benefit from fasting for many reasons. Fasting, when practiced correctly, has positive effects on female hormones. Women should not fast every single week exactly the same. Signs of fasting too frequently or too long include missed or heavy periods, hair loss, heart palpitations, and anxiety. Nutrition matters, and fiber is great for female hormones. Optimize diet before implementing fasting. The more you practice fasting, the easier it gets. Enjoy this episode in the fasting series right here on Veggie Doctor Radio. Dr. Mindy Pels, welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. Oh, Dr. Yami, thank you for having me here. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> it's such an honor to have you. You are such a superstar. You're doing amazing mm-hmm. work. And uh, the reason I invited you on the podcast is because I'm doing a fasting series. Nice. and so many questions come up about fasting, particularly around women. So before we get into your wisdom and your experience around fasting, I want to hear about your journey. How did you discover fasting for yourself? And then at what point did you start applying it to your patients? 
Yeah, it's it's a it's a very long journey. So I'm going to try to tell it in the shortest way possible. <laughs> um, you know, I, the the when I turned 40, um, I really had one goal in my life, and that was to be in the best shape. I, I wanted to hit 40 like in my favorite pair of skinny jeans. I wanted the weight, the number on the scale to to be the number I wanted to see, and so I, I put a lot of time and effort into my fitness. And I hit it, and then at 43, like everything fell apart. Like I was gaining weight despite working out and eating eating what I perceived was right at the time. Um, I my, wasn't sleeping. My mood started going off, and so I realized, gosh, you know, I'm I'm missing something. I was doing all the right supplements, all the you know, all the right things that I knew at that time. And about that, that um, at that moment, uh, Dr. Osumi's work had just been honored for a Nobel Prize t in his uh, teachings of autophagy. And autophagy is this concept that when we go without food, the body heals itself. And so I dove into his research and realized, gosh, I had never really tried fasting before. Let me look into that and see if that's something that would help me as I was transitioning into this perimenopausal time of my life. And like literally within a couple of weeks of uh, just something as simple as 13 hours of fasting every single day, just skipping my breakfast, I started to drop weight. My mental clarity came back. I started uh, sleeping well. Um, I, my energy went through the roof. I didn't have my 3 p.m in the afternoon crash and like literally my life changed in like two weeks. Mm -hmm. And so that started my journey into understanding what the heck happened to me. And it was kind of two pronged because I wanted to know what happened to me that caused me to have to, to go uh, to start to have so many problems. But then I also wanted to understand what was it about fasting that brought my health to this whole new level and so quickly. And so that really was the beginning of me integrating uh, really hormones and perimenopause into the concepts of fasting that I'm now teaching. So yeah, so great that you thought about trying it and that you had <laughs> such quick results so that it prompted you to continue on the journey. I think my story is kind of similar because I'm 43 as well. So I don't know if that's oh, wow. the magic oh, number where things yeah, start it's happening. <laughs> It's, it's but, the time, the wake up. Yeah, number. but yes, yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's so frustrating because you get to the age where you almost feel like, you know, I'm starting to get this life thing. Like, yeah. you know, you yeah. know, I feel like I've got the, some wisdom and experience is good. And all of a sudden you're so tired. And like, I would feel like I was getting hit by a bus every night and um, joint pains and all of those things. And so finding that fasting, I feel like for me also, it was very quick. Within a week, my energy came right back and I was like, oh, this is amazing. And so then yeah. it kind of prompts you on there. So that's really cool. So how about, how long did it take before, whether it was self-experimentation or more learning about fasting that you started applying it to your patients? Yeah. So what was interesting is I, I fell in love with fasting. I'm a, I always say that I have a little bit of an obsessive mind. When I find something I love, I don't just do a little bit of it. I do a lot of it. And so um, I started to apply pieces of it. But what was the big thing was I started to get excited about a three-day water fast. And that was based off of Walter Longo's research showing that three days of fasting would reboot the whole immune system. And so I really wanted to experience that and see what, what would happen if I did a three-day water fast. So, but I was a little nervous. And so I'm like, well, let me gather some of my patients and we'll do it together as a group. And so there were actually about 15 of us um, that, you know, I had 14 patients that were willing to go down this journey with me. And um, we did, and they happened to all be women, and we did a three-day water fast together. And, it, you know, knowing these women so well, and knowing what their health problems were, for me to be able to see the, the effects that a longer fast could have on them was, was uh, insane. Like, I, I, it blew me away. And that was really the moment that I was like, hey, this is a tool that everybody needs to know. And so I started applying it in all of my treatment. I mean, everybody from men to women um, really got, got uh, when I was putting together their treatment plans, fasting became part of it. And, and everybody had a different length fast, but I really, it was profound found when you added fasting into diet changes and supplementation and different biohacks like 
it made all of those other therapies work so much more efficiently. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool also that your patients were willing to experiment with you. That's neat that you even had the idea to do that. That's that's kind of a cool thing to yeah, do. Yeah, you know, the, the video, that was that was because I'm 53 now. That was 10 years ago. And um, the video is out there somewhere where we I interview them all after uh, after the three days were over. And, you know, the one thing that really struck me, too, I remember from the video is the self pride. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I still see that so much today is like there's so much healing that happens when we fast. And yet it can be intimidating. It can be a, a little bit of a daunting task. Um, but as you go through it, there's highs and there's lows and there's spiritual insight. Um, but at the end of it, you feel amazing and you can only thank yourself for it. Nobody mm -hmm. can do it for you. And so what I learned from those women was, oh my gosh, I had just given them a gift of being able to see how powerful they were. And that, I, I think more than anything, really got me excited about fasting. That's super cool. Well, let's talk about why women are afraid of fasting because mm -hmm. intermittent fasting time restricted eating even extended water only fasting it's been getting more and more popular over the past few years more people are talking about it but then you hear the but women yeah. shouldn't fast or women need to be really careful or it's going to really mess up your hormones so what kind of things do you feel discourage women from even trying it it's such, this is such a good question. Um, I think there's multiple things. So for starters, I think the fear of going without food is, is, is a primal fear um, for both men and women. And um, so, you know, we don't, we have never, most people have not ventured into 24 hours without food, 36 hours, 48, 70, you know, 72. We, and so it, we worry that we're going to pass out. We worry that something's going to be harmful in our body. And what I'm trying to educate people on is that actually when you go into a fasted state, you're going into a healing state. And you are accessing parts of your internal innate healing that you can't access with food. You can't access with supplements. You can't biohack your way into that. And so I think it's lack of knowledge and it's like, well, if I, I remember going, you know, skipped breakfast one time and I wanted to kill everybody. Now you want me to go 24 hours? No way. But what I'm, I've been seeing as we've been training women to fast is that they're, they click into this healing state and then they have this whole new relationship. So I think it's the first one is just fear that it's going to get harder and that it's going to be more uh, painful the longer you go. And the opposite is, is completely true. So that's, that's the first step. The second thing, and this is why I wrote Fast Like a Girl, is, I mean, recently in the last couple of years, the media has really taken this concept that women shouldn't fast and has plastered it all over the internet and magazines and 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 w with really no uh, validity and so it's it's kind of an urban sort of myth that's out there that women shouldn't fast and that's what i'm really trying to break apart because we sh we benefit from fasting we just can't fast all the time and we need to know how to fast around our hormones mm -hmm. so there are important key differences which we'll get yes. into later but let's start with what type of women would particularly benefit from fasting yeah. So, oh my gosh, there's so many. Um, you know, let's let's let me think of it in in age categories. So, um, for women that are in the childbearing ages, let's start with something like infertility. So, you know, infertility is multi pronged. There's a lot of reasons for it, um, and yet insulin resistance can be a huge reason for not ovulating um, a, 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 on a regular basis. Let's just put it. Let's keep it simple like that. So we've seen uh, tremendous results with women getting pregnant using what I call in the book the fasting cycle. So learning how to go in and out of fasting according to a woman's menstrual cycle, we start to see that, uh, uh, that fertility comes back. So that's the first one. The second one that I would say that happens in the 20s and 30s that we see a lot is PCOS. 
And PCOS is the number one, as you know, the hormonal problem for women. Um, and it's got two prong, two pieces to it. It is insulin resistance mixed with toxicity. So we start to see that the symptoms of PCOS can be diminished if we get a woman learning how to fast around her cycle. Um, and then the, the, the other category that is a huge category and one that's near and dear to my heart um, is the perimenopause menopausal women. And what a lot of women don't realize about menopause is that we're losing estrogen. And as we lose estrogen, we become more insulin resistant. So it's part of the game of perimenopause. So after 40, if we can learn to cycle our fast, there's no better tool out there to overcome insulin resistance than to learn how to even do something as simple as intermittent fast. Mm -hmm. And so um, we see that for navigating the, the menopause journey, fasting becomes this critical, critical tool. So those are kind of the three big ones, but I mean, we've seen now, uh, I mean, we get millions of views uh, and comments on my YouTube channel every month. And what I am seeing is mental health is improving. Um, you know, weight loss, of course, is really a, a big thing. People are sleeping better, mental clarity, uh, energy's up. Anything, anywhere in the body that has mitochondria, um, which is pretty much, you know, the, the whole body, but um, the brain, the eyes, the heart, the muscles, like these are areas that when you start to fast, you are giving these mitochondria another fuel source called ketones. And those ketones go in and supercharge those areas. So, you know, if you have mitochondrial dysfunction of any kind in any part of your body, fasting becomes the, that, that key um, uh, uh, mechanism that can start to initiate repair in those mitochondria. Yeah, it's so amazing. What about other chronic health conditions? You mentioned PCOS, which is associated with hormones and hormonal dysfunction, but what about other chronic conditions do you see in your patients? Are they responding pretty well? Things like diabetes, high cholesterol, those kinds of things. Uh, yeah, and it, this is this is the part that is going to sound a little bit like Maybe I'm being Pollyanna-ish, but it's pretty much everything. So um, because here's the, here's the concept that I want people to know. You have two energy systems, and we call them metabolisms, but let's just for simplicity's sake, you have two ways your body makes energy. One is from the foods you eat, and the other is in the absence of food. I call them your sugar burner energy system and your fat burner energy system. If all you're doing is manipulating your diet and you're not going an extended period without food, you are leaving a whole energy system out. So when all of a sudden we start to fast, you are, you're doing something called metabolic switching, where you are taking your switching from your sugar burner energy system into your fat burner energy system. And in that fat burning energy system, not only are you going to lose weight because your body's burning energy from fat, but you are seeing an amplified healing effect. So let's take somebody with diabetes. With diabetes, we know that's an insulin resistance issue. So it's ridiculous how many people I have seen get off their diabetes medication or even reverse, we've even type one diabetes, I've seen um, a, a lot of those symptoms reverse where somebody is on very low amounts of insulin using a fasting lifestyle. So both type two, type two diabetes, type two diabetes, yeah, I mean, that, that was Jason Fung's whole, whole work is like, how do we stop type 2 diabetes? Well, fasting is, is the cure. So, so for sure there. Cholesterol is an interesting one because we get a lot of people who will say, well, my cholesterol went up when I started to fast. Well, you have to look at what cholesterol, where cholesterol is made, and it's made in the liver. And so when you start to go into this fat burner energy system, what's happening is that you're asking your liver to make ketones. And if the liver's already struggling with toxicity, if it's already common bile duct is already uh, like um, uh, packed with sludge that it, from all the, the stuff that's dumped out of the gall, gallbladder and the liver and all the gu gut uh, bacteria that's coming from the small intestine, then you will start to see cholesterol go up. But for the most part, I would say that 80% of people, when they start to fast, they're healing their liver. And when you heal your liver, you also are going to heal the cholesterol system. 
So, so yeah, but cardiovascular, we've seen blood pressure come down. I mean, you name it, cancers, not all cancers, but many cancers um, can be reversed. One of the greatest studies that I, that I love is one done uh, on women post um, uh, traditional uh, cancer treatment for breast cancer, that if all they did is fast 13 hours every single day, they had a 64% less chance of reoccurrence of, of breast cancer, which is insane. So there's so much. I mean, we've seen studies that show uh, you can shut down viral uh, replication when you're, you're in a fasted state because viruses ha live off of glucose. So if you bring glucose down and you move into a state, uh, put a cell into a state of autophagy, viruses can't replicate if they come into your body. So we have, you know, immunity and, and inflammation. I mean, it's literally endless, the possibilities. And I, and I think the way I'd like to th people to think about this is it's like sleep. You know, we know sleep is a healing experience. And just because it's healing doesn't mean everybody can do it. Um, and so fasting is the same way. It's a healing state you're putting your body in. It's just you got to train yourself how to do it. Yes, definitely. That just like sleep, it's a repair. It's a period of repair. And yes. that's one of the things that I've learned in pediatrics too, being a pediatrician, that children naturally, when they're sick, they don't want to eat much yeah. and they want to sleep. And of course, that freaks parents out on both levels. Why is my child sleeping so much and they don't want to eat anything? But I explain to parents, this is how they're responding to their body. Their body is saying, hey, we need to use less energy doing all of these things so that we can focus our energy on repairing, on dealing with this uh, attack to our system. So thank I you so that. much. Thank you so much for that explanation. Okay, so before we go into cycle syncing with fasting and you know some of the other issues that we may see particularly for women that are fasting let's cover who should not fast is there are there mm. any groups of people any types of people who should not be fasting yeah and thank you for asking this especially if we have a lot of women listening so the first thing is if you're pregnant this is not your tool so um i don't i don't recommend it um, now, I understand in the first trimester, a lot of women don't want to eat, um, but that's your innate telling you what to do. But as far as, um, you know, fasting during pregnancy, not your tool. Uh, nursing moms, I, I recommend that you keep your fast under 15 hours because over 15 hours, you're going to start to stimulate autophagy. And when you stimulate autophagy, the body starts to get rid of cells and toxins that um, no longer serve you. That will go into your breast milk mm -hmm. and then into your baby. So we, we keep fast at 15 hours, uh, no longer than that. Um, and then the, the third group um, that I really recommend um, that they get some support is anybody who's had an eating disorder. So um, I, it, you know, I have seen fasting really help uh, uh, people reverse an eating disorder, but that's only with the support of the a psychologist or a doctor or somebody who is with them along that journey because fasting can change your relationship to food. But having said that, it would not be a journey you would do on your own if you don't, if you have an eating disorder. You need to involve somebody to walk that with you who is skilled at helping you understand when to fast, when not to fast, how to make sure things don't get triggered in your brain that will set you back. Yeah, because especially with people that have eating disorders or a history of disordered eating, it can lead to extremes. And if misused, not used in the right way, it can lead yeah. to some worsening symptoms of that. Okay, so why should menstruating people sync fasting to their cycles? Can you tell us a little bit more about this? So what you're saying is that women shouldn't be afraid of fasting, but there is a different way that it should be approached. That's right. So it all boils down to our sex hormones. So when we look at men, men are hormonally driven by one sex hormone, testosterone. Testosterone will, will be uh, made in the outer uh, cells of the testes, will go up to the brain and convert to estrogen. So men really need to only focus on thinking about testosterone. Women, we have to think about testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. So our three sex hormones um, are, are made by the fecal cells on the outside of the ovaries and some peripheral tissues, our adrenal glands. But what happens with these three sex hormones is they have vastly different personalities, especially estrogen and progesterone. 
So I always say that estrogen and progesterone are like sisters. They may look alike, they may have the same name, but they have major different personalities. Estrogen, which comes in strong in the first part of your cycle, day one all the way through ovulation in that follicular phase, does really well with fasting. Keep your glucose down, keep yourself insulin sensitive, and you're going to really allow estrogen to shine. Progesterone, she's completely the opposite. So in fact, progesterone wants you to keep glucose up in order for uh, you to have enough uh, precursor to be able to make progesterone. So, you know, when, when we go into a fasted state, when we, re, we go into the ketogenic kind of mentality, the week before our period, when progesterone's trying to make her appearance, we're going to see that progesterone starts to diminish. So it's, it's really in those two sex hormones that make the big difference. So um, progesterone wants glucose up. We actually are more insulin resistant the week before our periods. Uh, uh, progesterone doesn't want cortisol around. Uh, cor cortisol is going to make progesterone hide, uh, whereas estrogen is very forgiving of cortisol. So with, when you go into a fast, you are lowering glucose, and d just like exercise, you're raising cortisol temporarily. So that, those two pieces make it better for estrogen than, than for progesterone. So front half of your cycle, fast all you want, back half of your cycle, it's time to eat. Interesting. So what are some signs that people might be fasting too much or too long then? What, what symptoms are they going to be having? Yeah, so the first one is missing a period. And this is one that helped me, was why I created this whole, um, uh, I call it the fasting cycle for women to follow, is because I started to see so many of my community, they fell in love, so many women fell in love with fasting that they just did it all the time. And the first thing I, saw, I heard was, I'm spotting, um, or I, I, I missed a, my period, um, or I'm hemorrhaging when I start to, to bleed, they're having big clots, um, or my hair is falling out, um, I, and my anxiety is high, and that's all signs that they were fasting at the wrong time. So it's more about, for women, it's not so much that they're fasting too much, it's that they're not cycling enough. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the real pivotal is when we, um, heart palpitations, anxiety, hair loss. Uh, sometimes we'll see weight gain. Uh, sometimes we can see the thyroid get thrown off. The thyroid needs calories to be up a little bit higher. So a lot of people who end up doing one meal a day sometimes aren't getting enough calories to get the support to the thyroid. So those are all signs that you've been fasting either too much or at the wrong part of your cycle. Okay. And I think that makes a lot of sense, too, because I feel like a lot of menstruating people report that before their period, that's when you're just you're craving the carbs, you're wanting to eat more, right. you're hungrier. And so yeah. if you're trying to push through that and fast too long or too much during that time, it's increasing that stress, increasing the stress hormone, lowering your progesterone, which those of us in perimenopause already have too much of that going That's on. Right. So we don't want to exacerbate that because that brings out those symptoms that are, are not That's good. Right. So, okay, well, thank you so much for explaining that. So if a person learns how to do this, they can kind of maintain this cyclical nature. Do at some point, are they able to do it intuitively or do you have to be more precise about it and be like, okay, I'm on day this, I need to, you know, not fast more than this many hours. How does it work eventually once you get the hang of it? Yeah. In the beginning, you're going to need to kind of look at your cycle. So, you know, day one through day 10, you can do great, you know, longer fast. Then when you move into ovulation, which is day 11 to day 15, I'm giving generalizations. Um, then you're going to want to keep your fast a little shorter, like 13, 15 hours, when you come out of ovulation, there's a dip in hormones for a few days, so you can do a little longer fast. But then when you hit about day 19, 20, when progesterone's coming in, you're going to want to get out of fasting and, get, and make sure you're getting your glucose up. So what I find is w once you've gone through that cycle once or twice, then it becomes a lot more intuitive. Mm -hmm. And what the intuitive, the, the part that's really interesting to me is once you clue in, 
you'll start to see that your hunger varies it through your menstrual cycle as well. And it looks like once you start to bleed, those first couple of days, maybe the first, I have some women say, well, the first couple of days I'm really hungry. Um, but I have a theory on that. So let me sort of say what I, what I think we all should be feeling, which is about day two or three of our cycle, we're not hungry. We actually want to fast because that's what estrogen wants us to do. And then to your point, like you said earlier, the, the week before our period, how many of us have craved carbs and we, and we crave chocolate and we want to sit on the couch and we villainize that? But that's what progesterone wants. She wants you to bring up the glucose. She wants you to give her magnesium from the chocolate and she wants you to keep cortisol down so chill out on the couch. So if we start, one of the big things I'm trying to get women to do is let's just look at those two pieces. Front half of your cycle, you, you're, you can go into more of the habits that are going to help you, like more of the extreme working out, um, more fasting, more keto that are going to help you keep your weight where you want, whereas the back half, we're going to actually give the body nature's carbs. And we're going to slow down. We're going to change our exercise. We're going to stop, um, stop so much fasting, and which is what we innately want to do anyways. We've just been pushing through it for so many years. So to your point, I really feel like it becomes intuitive. But we have been not taught our hormones, so we don't even, we're not even in touch with our own natural hormonal rhythm. So what this, this style of fasting is doing is getting you back in touch with your own normal hormonal rhythm, and then it just becomes effortless and intuitive. Yeah. I, I mean, I've heard this so many times and from so many experts that talk about we need to you know, cycle different foods and all this kind of stuff. And I'm always thinking like, how am I gonna do that with my lifestyle? I'm so busy. Like I don't get a rest period. So I don't get to just yeah. lie on the couch, you know? So I think that's the biggest barrier for me is like, I'm thinking I don't, I have, my life is regimented. This is how I live my life. So it would take, it's gonna take a lot of practice for me to try to kind of lean into those cycles and accept the fact that it's okay to rest before my period. It's okay, you know, to increase my my eating window because I'm I'm an OMAD girl too. So oh, yeah, I think there that, we that go. would I think that that is gonna definitely take a lot of practice for me. But I think that's really good to know and something to definitely think about. Yeah. Okay. I and, wanna and, switch can, oh, go ahead. Yeah, let me just say one thing on that because I think I, I felt the same way when I first started practicing these principles and I I think a lot of women do. Um, there's an amazing book that I recommend every woman read called Rushing Woman Syndrome. And it's by Dr. Libby Weaver. And um, what I, when I read that book, I actually cried because I was about 47 at the time. And what I realized was that just because we are women, just because we are ridiculously powerful, just because we can do anything we want, doesn't hormonally mean we are meant to. Mm. And that, is a, that was really hard for me to grab. So I, I've just learned that when progesterone's coming in, just the simple act of just slowing down, saying no, um, going to bed a little earlier, eating some more sweet potatoes, bringing up those carbs just a little bit, just the sh progesterone's really the one that we have to think about with that overscheduled sort of rushing lifestyle. Otherwise, and, and if, we, if we mind that, then the rest of the cycle gets a lot easier. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to try it. For sure. I will try it. <laughs> we'll see how well know. I do it. But yeah, I would be probably the epitome of rushing woman because it, it's, you know, my career, family, kids at that age, you know, all of these yep. different commitments. But I, I, I should read that book as well. So I'll check out that recommendation. Yeah, you'll love it. It's full of biochemistry. You'll love it. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about food. So what is a ketobiotic diet? Why? And when do you recommend it as far as what part of the cycle? And is it possible to achieve on a plant-based diet? So this is a question I had as I was reading your book. Can, can plant-based people follow the ketobiotic style? Yeah, it's such a good question. I'm so happy you asked. Um, you know, we have a, a fasting group on Facebook called the Resetter Collaborative, and we have over 60,000 people in there and lots of plant-based um, um, uh, aficionados, that's what I'll, I'll call it, you know, uh, devotees, how about that? Um, and it, it absolutely works. So 
Here's what's interesting about the ketogenic diet is that when it became popular, everybody thought of it as extremely low carb. And low carb was like zero to 10 grams of carbohydrates um, a day. The challenge with that is that you're not getting enough plants. You're not getting enough enough carbohydrates and, and you need carbs and you need plants. So what I did with my community is I came up with this term called ketobiotic. And what I did is I raised the carbs to 50 grams of net carbs, which means you take the total carbs and you subtract the fiber um, and that will give you a net carb. Now with, with plants, that usually gives you enough to be able to eat a, a lot of plants um, because you're taking out the fiber piece of it. It also, I like the biotic piece because what I'm really wanting uh, people to focus on are some of the probiotic, prebiotic, and polyphenol foods that you'll find in a plant-based diet. So these are your sauerkrauts, your kimchi, your um, even some of the like uh, fermented coconut yogurts. Um, prebiotics are your nuts and your seeds, and polyphenols are are your olives and your chocolate. And, and many of your fruits. So with ketobiotic, it, you can a thousand percent do it plant-based. In, in Fast Like a Girl, we have a lot of plant-based reps, recipes because it's very easy to do plant-based because I brought the carbs up. If you need to bring the carbs up even higher to like 75 grams, that'll still work as long as the carbs are coming from plants. They're not coming from breads and pastas and cakes and cookies. Mm-hmm. So uh, it, it, was, it was really a, a, a hybrid version of keto that allowed both carnivores and plant-based um, lovers to, to fit into. Yeah, I love how you acknowledge the importance and the power of fiber and antioxidants yeah. and yeah. prebiotics because it is it terrifies me how many people are not eating any plants and you know that can lead to health consequences with changes in the gut microbiome and things like that so yeah we are definitely veggie lovers here awesome. at veggie awesome. doctor radio yeah. we support yeah. the broccoli and the cabbage and yeah. all those wonderful cruciferous and, vegetables and, you know on that point one thing that a lot of women aren't familiar with or don't know is that we have a whole set of bacteria in our gut that break estrogen down, the mm-hmm. estrobilome. And if if you're not eating plants, you're not breaking estrogen down. You're not oh. you're not supporting those microbes that break estrogen down and make estrogen usable. So I love I think a plant based diet is phenomenal. You just need to make sure. I like that we're calling it plant-based now as opposed to just vegetarian because I think one of the things that happened I was I was a a vegetarian like 20 30 years ago and we didn't know what we know now and so I did sort of the ugly vegetarian where I just wasn't eating meat but I was eating Dorito chips and and you know things that were not supporting a healthy microbiome to me when I think of plant-based I'm like okay that means I'm I'm it's almost like plant forward I am going to make plants the center of my diet as opposed to I'm just not eating meat. Yeah. Well, and focusing on whole foods. I think that's where people get tripped up is there's a big difference between whole plant foods, eating your vegetables and your beans. And I I did notice that the recipes had a lot of delicious, amazing looking recipes that were plant-based. So there are a lot of legumes in there too, which I'm very pro bean. So, you know, there's a difference between these whole foods that are intact, that have the fiber intact compared to ultra processed foods that also don't contain any animal products and can not support our health as well as our whole foods. So thank you for making that point. Yeah. Okay, so if someone is new to fasting and they want to try it, how do they start? Yeah, it's a great question. So here's, here's where I recommend if you've never fasted, you actually start with your food changes. And here are the three food changes that I want everybody to make. Um, the first is change your oils. So make sure you're doing good oils, not bad oils. Um, we tend to think of carbs and sugar as being the, the big drivers of insulin resistance, but it's actually the toxic in oils. The canola, the vegetable, the soybean, the corn, the cottonseed, um, these, are, these are highly processed oils 
um, that will make you insulin resistant. So just swap them out for the olive oil, the avocado, the sesame oil, the MCT oil. Um, all of those come from, from plants, which is beautiful. Um, so the oil change is the first. The second is that when we say carbs, we lump all the carbs together in one category. And I'd like to sort of change that languaging. And I'd like to say that there are man-made carbs and there are nature's carbs. And I think we should be focusing on 95, if not 100% of our diet coming from nature's carbs. And nature's carbs are obviously anything that came from the ground or from the tree. It's all your fruits, your vegetables, your potatoes. Sweet potatoes are my favorite. Um, and, and get rid of the breads, the cakes, the pastas, the cookies. Um, make that change. And then the third is to look at any toxic ingredients. So make sure you're, to your point, eating whole foods, um, staying away from things that have synthetic chemicals in it. Once you've done that, now fasting is going to be much easier. So you start by pushing your breakfast back. And I usually say push your breakfast back an hour. And here's, the, here's what's going to be interesting is if you could just push your breakfast back an hour, see how you do for a couple of days. And once that is easy then or getting easier, push it back another hour. Okay, And then do that for maybe three or four days. And then push it back another hour. And your first fasting ledge is 13 hours. I'd like, there's an incredible study that, um, you know, around that 13 hours that we talked about showing the breast cancer um, uh, reoccurrence. That was a 13-hour mark. So let's just get, especially for women, let's just get you to 13 hours. And so once you're there... You can actually now in the book, I have six different length fasts. Now you're, you're going to be uh, capable to go 17 where autophagy kicks in or 24 hours where your gut starts to repair or 36 hours where you start to burn more fat. 48, you, get, you reset your dopamine system and 72, you reset your immune system. So, But that first ledge is the hardest one to get to. And once you get there, now your body's getting an understanding. Oh, okay, when food doesn't come in, I go into this other energy system and I start to heal. It has that innately in it and it knows once you train it, it's like, oh, okay, I get it. And this is what's so fascinating to me about fasting. Unlike any other diet that we have ever done, it gets easier with time. The more you do it, the easier it gets, the more intuitive it gets, except the week before your, your, your period. And then you'll, I, I see so many women that are like, I was doing so well and now I'm hungry. And I'll say, well, what day of your cycle are you on? Um, day 21. Yeah, because progesterone wants you to eat. So, um, but that's, it's really that, that gentle um, and, and it works. I just see it work over and over and over again. Uh, I love it. That's such great advice. I love how you lined it up like that. And I think that that's great advice. Obviously, um, we're very aligned in the food area in that people just need to eat more whole foods, less processed foods, um, get those beneficial foods that are rich in fiber and um, antioxidants and all of that. But that just starting to decrease your eating window a little bit, increase your fasting window, because there's so many people that are eating till so late at night and yeah. as soon as they get up in the morning. And so that's a, for some people, that's already kind of a big step. So don't try to go from, you know, eating 20 hours a day to trying to not eat at all for 24 hours, you know, just move it little by little. And you'll see that that makes a big difference because some people really are eating pretty much around the clock. So, yeah. and then having this short little time to sleep. <laughs> right, and right. And the rest of the time and, eating. You know, you know what's interesting on that, and this can maybe help people untrain themselves out of the nighttime eating, is that when, when it gets dark out, melatonin shows up and it prepares us for sleep. But melatonin also makes us insulin resistant because we're not supposed to be eating right before we go to bed. So the dinner you eat at eight o'clock is going to be stored more as fat Whereas if you take that dinner and you have that same dinner at five o'clock when it's when melatonin's low and it's light out, it's not going to be stored as easily because you're going to be more insulin resistant or more insulin sensitive at that time and your body will have a better glucose response. So when you eat in the dark, you actually are doing more damage hormonally because you aren't meant to eat when it's dark because melatonin's meant to calm everything down, shut down everything down. It's not there to support a, a big meal. 
Yeah, it's time to rest and digest. And I tell people, just start paying attention to how you feel when you eat late. We generally yeah. feel hung over the next morning. Right. It's a horrible yes. feeling. And it's you don't horrible. have to be drinking. You just have to eat late. And then you That's wake right. up and you're just like bags under your eyes. And you feel all puffy and like, why do I feel like this? Yeah. Of course, you know, now in your 40s, it's like you're so sensitive to any of these things. But okay, Dr. Pals, this has been wonderful. I appreciate you so much. Before we get to the last three fasting rapid fire questions, if you can please tell my listeners where they can connect with you what products and services you offer, where they can find your book, et cetera. Mm, thank you. Uh, well, you can go to my website, Dr. Mindy Pels. There's a lot there. Um, I always tell people that my passion, where my heart really lies, is in my YouTube channel. Um, I'm putting the, the, the most recent science out on metabolic health out there. Um, I, I do new videos every week. Um, I have a lot on the application of fasting. Um, Fast Like a Girl is the first fasting manual for women that has ever been published with a major publisher before. And so you can go to fastlikeagirl.com or go to Amazon. It's at Amazon. Um, so uh, there, that's where you can, you can find all those resources. Um, we have a free fasting group on Facebook. It's called Resetter Collaborative, so you can join that. And then if you really need more support, we have a membership group where uh, myself and several of our coaches are in there supporting people in helping to figure out these principles for themselves. Because as you know, as women, we all have individual needs and this one size fits all is not working for us. So we created this membership group to help women figure out how their fasting behavior should and what their fasting lifestyle should look like. So you can find that on my website. I love it. Yeah, you have so many resources. So pretty mm, much if you. anybody has a question, look on the YouTube channel, read the books. The book is very readable, but has lots of great information in there. And for all us plant-based people, there are plenty of plant-based recipes. So do not fear. <laughs> Beautiful. I, I appreciate that because we went to great lengths to make sure we could make both both camps happy. Yay. Well, we're so happy you thought of us. Okay. Yeah, so you. are you ready for the rapid fire question? I am. I okay. Am. What's your favorite thing about fasting? Oh, uh, the, the mental clarity and energy I feel. Yeah. I love it. What's your biggest fasting pet peeve, such as a myth, misconception, or misuse of fasting? That, um, that you fast the same way all the time. Uh, yeah. It, 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 yeah. The O matters. I was going to say the O matters, but you told me you're an O matter. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, the one meal a dayers, they do it all the time. And then they, you know, I, I really believe in fasting variation. So the pet peeve is just that we end up doing it the same way. And then you don't get the results that you really deserve to get. I heard you. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And what is the one thing you want people to understand about fasting? It is your inborn innate intelligence that wants you to move into this fasted state. This is not a diet. This is not a fad. This is the way your body wants you to treat it. Just like sleep heals, fasting heal, heals. Sleeping is not optional. Uh, fasting is not optional. Even though we've made it optional, it is truly a healing state that once you find your rhythm with it, you will discover so many miracles that your body was programmed to and designed with that you're not finding by just eating food and avoiding a fasting window. Beautifully said. Dr. Mindy Pels, thank you so much for being a guest on Veggie Doctor Radio. I appreciate your passion, your enthusiasm, and I can see that you're somebody that truly cares. You do this work because you really want to help people, and I appreciate you just going out there and putting this information out there. So thank you so much for everything that you do, and I hope that you have a very plantastic day. <laughs> I love it. Thank you for having me here. And yeah, happy fasting to everybody. So grateful for this conversation. Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.